scientific hypertrophy training. Are your children safe? Tonight, news at 11. Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isertel here for Renaissance Periodization. Let's talk about technique fundamentals for hypertrophy training specifically. So it turns out there are probably eight, as I count it, a little bit arbitrary, a little bit not, fundamentals for technique. And if you follow them, you're gonna have good technique on any exercise that you do. So they apply to every single exercise. Eight of them, let's take each of them one by one and see how they uh, sort of help you along with the training process. Here's the deal. At the end of the day, any good technique, any technique that's pronounced good from a hypertrophy training perspective has to suit at least four purposes. First of all, it has to stimulate the target muscle. Okay, duh. Because it's a great technique on bicep curls, but you're not even stimulating biceps. I don't even know what great technique means at that point. Secondly, they have to have the least fatigue generated for the stimulus. That doesn't mean zero fatigue, but if you have a technique that hits your biceps a little bit but crushes your elbows, that's not a good thing. So joint and connective tissue stress has to be minimized relative to how much stimulus there is. And the systemic fatigue should be, again, minimized relative to the stimulus. So if it takes you heaven and earth, do some kind of bicep curl variation, it zaps your strength for everything else completely. It's just emotionally super, super tough, but like it barely trains your biceps, that's not great. But if a technique it hits your biceps a ton, then at the same time, doesn't tax your rest of your system a ton, you're off to a pretty good start. The least fatigue per stimulus should also be generated, which means that joint and connective tissue stress should be minimized relative to the stimulus. So for example, if a bicep curl smashes your bicep, is it okay that if it you know irritates your elbows just a little bit and nothing too severe? Yeah, fine, it's worth it. But if something barely hits your biceps at all and just crushes your elbows, that's not good. Same idea for systemic fatigue. If something takes heaven and earth as far as motivation to actually do, but it doesn't stimulate the target muscle a lot, that's not a great thing. So you wanna make sure the trade-off is there. Number three, it should be safer than what's needlessly risky. If you have a technique and someone in 30 seconds of thought could be like, you know, if you did it this other way, you wouldn't be at severe risk of just ripping your quad off the bone. Maybe that's a better technique than the one you were doing. Lastly, Good technique is stable technique. It should be very similar technique time over time over time because it can guarantee that you're giving a certain amount of stimulus that you know what stimulus is. One rep of pull-up should be the same rep to rep to rep because you know six reps is meaningfully bigger always than four reps. And that will let you track performance. If you say, okay, I squatted 315 for a set of 10. Last month I squatted 295 for a set of 10. Did I get stronger? Well, if your squat is always the same to the same depth, same position, et cetera, then you know you got stronger. But if it's a different depth, different position, you can't really be sure if you actually made progress. So those are the underlying factors that lead to the best technique. And then the technique fundamentals come away from those. We count eight of them. I'm not gonna list them all here. You can look them at the screen. You can pause the video if you'd like. Let's get into each one, one by one, describe what it is, how to employ it, and why it's super important. So number one, full and standardized range of motion. Why? Because full range of motion just results in more muscle growth for a variety of reasons, mildly outside the scope of this video. Tons of other videos on this, tons of other pieces of literature. Full range of motion is just better than partial range of motion in almost every case, specifically with regard to hypertrophy. But there are limits to this. If doing more range of motion than you're doing now makes the exercise unsafe, don't do it. For example, if deadlifting to a deficit really rounds the crap out of your lower back and you feel like it's something's gonna go, probably a little bit too much range of motion. There's always a limit to that. And if a large degree of tension is removed from the target muscle doing an excessive range of motion, it's too much. For example, if you're doing dumbbell flies, if you go super, super deep at some point, it's really just your biceps that are getting trained and not your pecs anymore. They're out of their active range of motion at that point. It's not a great idea, so limit it there. But outside of that, forearm is usually best. In addition to that, using the same range of motion, more or less, set to set to set, rep to rep, is a really good idea because it lets you plan a stimulus. Okay, if you're doing 30 total reps of an exercise today, next week you're doing 35, you know 35 is gonna be more because each rep is the same. If some of the reps last week were really full range of motion, some of the reps this week were partial range of motion, the amount of total work and total muscle stimulus might have actually be lower this week than it was last week, even though you're doing five extra reps. So stimulus consistency and also tracking a performance, again, 
If your reps all look the same, you know that if you do more reps with more weight, so on and so forth, you just got better versus like, oh, I benched more, but I don't know, my reps were sort of like a little bit partial last time, and maybe this time they were even more full range, so that it gets stronger. You don't want any part of that. Full range of motion is king, super, super essential. Next, control eccentric. Here's the thing, concentric, the isometric and the eccentric each grow muscle as different parts of the movement, probably with slightly different mechanisms of action, so that getting all of them is a really good idea. Now, if you had to do only one, you don't, but if you had to do only one, the eccentric is probably the most hypertrophic out of all three, which if you skip the eccentric, you're skipping the one that me is, is like the, the most of it, right? If you, if you order a fast food meal of burger, fries, and Coke, speaking to the average person here, average preferences, it's like getting rid of the eccentric is like throwing the burger away. And someone's like, what do you eat? You're like fries and Coke. Like who the hell is it? Really? That's a meal? Like if you get rid of the fries, okay, you probably shouldn't have, but at least you got a burger and a Coke. If you got, you know, got rid of the Coke, the whole meal is difficult to eat because you have burger and fries and nothing to drink, right? The eccentric is the burger of that combo. And I can look, ideally you have all three, right? But people do the dive bombing thing where they curl up really fast and they come back down and curl up really fast and come back down. And that's not great. Even if it doesn't enhance your injury risk, then you're just missing probably the best part of the movement. So when you do your curls, for example, come up at a good speed and then control the eccentric. It doesn't need to be five seconds, but at least one second, at least physically resisting the lowering of the weight. And on the dive bombing thing, especially with exercises like squat, bench presses, pull-ups, the actual dive bombing of going down really fast can enhance injury risk and it's nothing you need in hypertrophy training. So control both lowers injury risk and makes you more likely to grow muscle, both awesome, fundamental to every single exercise you can think of. Next, no brainer, no cheating, okay? Cheating really is using untargeted muscles to do more weight and more reps. So when you cheat on the curl, you're using your glutes to do more curls. Well, how the hell does that make sense? Well, good news, I'll spare you. It doesn't make any sense at all and it causes some problems. First, you have to increase the load to do cheat curls and increasing load causes more injury. There's tons of videos of bodybuilders pulling their biceps doing cheat curls. I have not seen one video of a bodybuilder pulling their bicep doing regular curls with no cheating. So there's your thing. More load, needlessly by the way, because it's not the target muscle doing it, causes more injury risk. If you don't get hurt, it's at least more local joint and connective tissue fatigue. Right, If you're using 135 pounds on the curl, your elbows are gonna feel it more than if you use 100 pounds with strict technique without cheating. So you're almost like cheating is a way of loading your joints and connective tissues more for some sort of nebulous benefit. And the benefit we all know, it's just ego. You just wanna lift more weight, but you sort of make up all these reasons, all oh, the eccentric and all that, it's all BS. Next, you cause more systemic fatigue because it's greater total muscle mass involvement and more load. Okay, the amount of fatigue to your whole body, thus affecting all the other exercises you're gonna do later in the day or later in the week, from cheat curling 135 pounds is gonna be bigger than if you just use your biceps to curl 100 pounds. You're actually causing more systemic fatigue, and that's probably always a bad thing right, in most cases. Next, what about those muscles that are helping you cheat with a cheating bicep curl? The glutes, for example, the lower back, the hamstrings, your traps, whatever else you're using to cheat bicep curl, that actually gives them volume and increases their fatigue. It fatigues your glutes, fatigues your traps, fatigues your lower back, so on and so forth. But it's at a level of, sti of, of stimulus that is just not really good enough to promote any muscle growth. What's that? That's actually called junk volume. It's volume of training that the muscles get, but it essentially causes almost all fatigue and almost no growth. That's bad news. If you want your glutes to work and to get fatigued, they might as well be growing, doing lunges and deadlifts and all that other stuff. When you use your glutes, for example, to do cheat curls with, it just makes them tired. It's like saying, man, I want really big forearms. I'm gonna go become an auto mechanic and do this with wrenches all day. Like, yeah, that'll get your forearms bigger. It's gonna cause you 40 hours a week of work worth of fatigue. That's terrible. You can do like a, a sum total of three minutes of, of, of curling, you know, various uh, wrist curls, and all of a sudden you've gained all the form size you would as a mechanic instead of spending 40 hours, you spent several minutes, right? So definitely cheat stuff is a real bad deal because it poisons the rest of the muscles we're using. When you go in and you want to train your glutes, you want your glutes fresh, not your glutes a little bit beat up, uh, a little bit underperforming because of the fact that you've used your uh, glutes for bicep curls. So that doesn't make any damn sense. Next, cheating makes tracking and comparing essentially impossible. How the hell do you know if your biceps are getting stronger? You don't, 
because you've been using your glutes and biceps. And who knows, you've been maybe using your biceps less or your glutes more. Nobody can tell. If it's strict technique, you can tell. If not, who knows? And a lot of folks give a lot of credence to mind-muscle connection. And there is some there. How the hell are you supposed to have mind-muscle connection if you're busy cheating and heave hoeing the weights? Some of the same bodybuilders will say, look, mind-muscle connection is real important. They're doing curls with a super cheat. That's basically mutually exclusive. If you want a mind-muscle connection, make sure everything's strict, only use your biceps, and really focus on them. That's about it. Next, specific position dogma. Okay, anytime you talk about technique fundamentals, a lot of folks come in and say, you do have to do this exercise exactly this way, and if you don't move your shoulder like this, you're gonna die, all kinds of bad things are gonna happen. Here's the thing. General positions are very easy to describe, and they best stimulate uh, target muscle through any kind of movement. But there's tons of individual variation. For example, where to put your grips? Are pull-ups best like this or are they best like this? Well, both of them are probably good and it really just depends on the individual and sometimes they're both good so you can do one for a while and do another for a while. How to flare your elbows and knees, where to put your feet and stuff on a hack squat, how to position your toes. There's tons of variation here. A lot of it, all the exercises work well. It's just options. I get a ton of questions on my social media like, is it better to do rows with an overhand grip like this? Or is it better to overhand grip like that or underhand? Well, that's like asking, hey, what's better? You know, brown rice, oatmeal, or pasta? Like, well, gee, there's just three different carb sources. They're both fine. And when you get bored of one, you go to the other. Same idea, right? In the end, nobody can tell you like, look, the reason you're not getting delt development is because your elbow is not just like uh, basically put like this. Or you got to do that. At the end, SFR has to rule the day. Stimulus to fatigue ratio. If you're getting a great stimulus using a technique, following the fundamentals, and if the fatigue is low, you're good to go. Don't worry about super specific positions. There's just really, there's nothing, there's no treasure under that rock. So don't worry about the super exactitudes. Next, technical absolutism and making sure to avoid it. So here's the thing. People will say, you do a bicep curl, and when you're doing the curl, when the weight juts out in front of you, you tend to lean back. And people say, aren't you not supposed to lean back on the curl? Well, here's the thing. Weights change your center of gravity. So if you have 100 pounds on a barbell out here and you weigh 200 pounds, then all of a sudden the center of gravity moves forward into your body, possibly right to outside of your body. If you didn't lean back, you would physically fall forward and that would be it. You have to lean back. So in real world training, the lifter is not the only part of the system. The weights play an effect to some leaning has to occur adjusting for the weights. People say, you know, aren't you supposed to just squat up and down? That's physically impossible to do. You will fall. Everyone has to lean somewhat. Some people with long femurs and short torsos have to lean a lot, and there's nothing wrong with that. Another one, people think your body is just a simple diagram with like two joints in it, and, and, and thus everything is super simplified. There's other muscles, there's other joints that have to be involved. For example, people say the row, that's for your lats, right? The row is not just for your lats, it's for your middle traps, it's for your rhomboids, it's for your teres major, and it's okay to let your scapulae sink and then retract them because that's part of the rowing motion. People will say like, you should keep your scap stable when you're rowing. Who the hell made that up? That's an insane technical absolutism that borders on religion. Why would you keep that stable when you can move it and get muscle growth from it? Your body's a little bit more complex than just like one joint and one muscle at a time. Lastly, a lot of the folks that put a lot of stock into this overthink the crap out of their technique. And while they're busy overthinking it, they're under trying. Once you have a good basic technique set in motion, you gotta train hard and get close to failure. If you're so busy worrying about, okay, my elbow is 90 degrees, okay, 90 degrees, oh, that was 89 degrees, that's no good. If you're thinking that kind of stuff, you're usually missing out on those many hard reps or a few hard reps before failure, and you're probably not getting the greatest results. So worry more about training hard with good technique and less about insane absolutism, right? Use the fundamentals, don't cheat, and then let the body adjust to the movement naturally while pushing the target muscle hard. Don't overthink the stuff because overthinking comes at the price of under trying. Number six, you don't want to let non-targets limit you. What does that mean? Well, the best training stimulus is when the target muscle is a limiting factor. You don't want the following other things to be limiting factors in exercise, which means you stop before the target muscle is really close to failure because of other muscles, okay? If you're doing close grip benches in a certain technique and your triceps feel 100% fine, but your pecs are giving out, uh, gee, you know, you're really, that's not, that's a pec exercise now, it's not a tricep exercise. Your technique isn't wrong, but for the triceps, it is wrong, so you have to rework it. Grip. Okay, on lat pulldowns, 
If your grip is limiting you, you could be 10 reps in reserve when you think you're zero. That's no good. Each set is not very effective. Do something about your grip. What about your wrists? You can wear wrist straps on an incline barbell press and get five more reps or use 10 more pounds. If you don't, you get neither one of those. Are you really pushing your pecs and shoulders and triceps as hard as you thought you were? Or are your wrists limiting you? What about core? If you're using a weightlifting belt, for example, you may be able to get five more reps or use 20 more pounds on the squat. That's stimulus your quads get, right? That your core was previously preventing you from getting. That's not a good thing. You don't go to do squats to train your core. How many bodybuilders on stage are like, yep, got to train squats because I want the big midsection. Nobody says that. They want it for their quads. So make sure your quads are limiting factor. If the core is a limiting factor, make sure you solve that by potentially wearing a belt or something like that. Lastly, feet and ankles. Some people say, man, you know, like I can't leg press as deep as I'd like because my heels come up. Okay. And they try a weightlifting shoe and it's heeled shoe. And it's like, oh my God, this feels beautiful. And then they say something completely insane. Like, well, I don't want to use it as a crutch. What crutch? What are you talking about? Bodybuilding is a crutch. You're supposed to be getting strong just from nature, but you need to go to the gym, you wuss, right? There's no such thing as crutches. You, there's technologies and tools you use to become better and more muscular. Folks, use them all and don't let non-targets limit your performance. When you are going close to failure in exercise, it had better be that target muscle or muscles that are what stop you, right? When you've got your uh, Versa grips, your rowing, You've got a belt on potentially, everything's cored out, you're really strong, and you can't barely touch the bar anymore because of the pulling muscles of your back, they're the ones that are getting the most benefit. But if your core is limiting factor or the bar slips out of your hands, you can forget about back training being optimized. Next, number seven. Of all of the points that we just mentioned, one through six, if you apply all of them, you get a certain universe of techniques, a sample all of which are gonna be really good. What you wanna do is pick the techniques in there that are the least fatiguing specifically to your joints and connective tissues. For example, if you check all of those boxes, one through six, you can get three different squat stances. And then once you have your three different squat stances, you can be like, okay, well, one of these, my hips don't feel that great. One of these, my knees don't feel that great. But this one in the middle, it feels the best for sure on both hips and knees. That's the one you want to use, right? Because there can be more than a few movement patterns that give you a really good stimulus, you just have to find the ones in there and that could still be multiple that treat your joints the best. And bonus point is if you also choose the technique that doesn't require you to have as high of a rating of perceived exertion, that you might have your deficit push-ups with this grip might really blast your chest, everything feels great on the joints, but if you do this grip, you can stretch a little bit better and actually feels just, it feels like a more natural pushing position, so you don't even try that hard and your pecs get a great pump, awesome, better than having to try super hard and then, and then end up having the same amount of stimulus. It's more systemic fatigue, more spillover, it affects other muscles, and so on and so forth. Lastly, this isn't exactly a technique tip, but it has to be mentioned, is going too heavy or too light. Why? Well, some exercises are very difficult to do stimulatively if the load is mismatched. For example, if you try to do some isolations with very low reps, you can't even do the right kind of technique while maintaining anything like the focus on the muscle that is being trained. Side laterals, try doing side delt laterals for sets of six. It's kind of insane. Actually just hurts your connective tissues and barely trains your muscle. Push downs, wrist curls, calf raises. These are not exercises that are tailor-made to be trained very heavy. It's just not something that's very conducive. On the other hand, if you train stiff legged deadlifts, bent rows, squats, standing presses for very high reps, sets of 25, your core and your structural elements and your cardio is gonna give out way before the target muscle, and then you're not really training the target muscle yet again. So what you need to do is raise and lower the load to fit the exercise better. And good news, there's tons of exercises that you can use that are all over the load spectrum for any given muscle. For example, somebody could say, man, you know, hamstrings, I'm doing stuff like a deadlift. Anytime I'd go over like 10 or 12 reps, I just feel it in my back and I feel it in my cardio. It's not hams anymore as a limiting factor. Does that mean I just don't train hams in the 12 to 30 rep range? Nonsense. You go to seated leg curls and all of a sudden sets of 25 feel great. Or if you just do seated leg curls, 
you do sets of seven or eight and you're like, dude, I feel like my knees are going to pop off. It's weird. I don't need a pump. This sucks. And then you say, oh, I just train my hamstrings light all the time. No way. You do stuff like a deadlift or good mornings. And all of a sudden sets of eight feel amazing. So the good news is there's tons of exercises there to make sure to cover that entire loading range. Just don't pick exercises that don't correspond well to their loading range. All right. What are the implications of this? Well, first of all, if you know the eight factors of good technique, you can make sure you're always using them and always have really, really good technique. Awesome. If you don't know the specific technique on an exercise, let's say you see an exercise on a video and you say, ooh, I'd like to try that. If you just apply the eight factors, you get a huge head start into how to do the exercise right now. Good coach's eye can still inform you like, ooh, actually that looks good fundamentally, but you wanna move your elbows into the bar rather than away from the bar as you press. And like, ah, that changes it. Now I feel it in my triceps, so on and so forth. But knowing those eight is a big head start on organizing your techniques. You can be much, much ahead of the game versus just being like, I don't know how to do this movement. And lastly, if you see someone else, perhaps someone you look up to, someone you take wisdom from, a high-level bodybuilder or something, if you see someone violating one of the eight factors or more, than these eight fundamentals, maybe a few at a time, uh, or you're being coached to do so, there had better be some damn good reasons for that because most of these, you just never violate. Every now and again, you can get fudgy with some of them, but only for very good reasons, right? In our technique series that we've been doing, and you can check our playlist for the technique series, we cover a ton of technique specifics for a bunch of different exercises, but as you watch or rewatch the technique series, you can see that almost all of them, these eight fundamentals are mentioned. So if there's ever an exercise we don't get to or haven't gotten to yet in that series, check this video out, go over the eight guidelines, and you're going to be inventing a technique or perfecting it for the exercise you want that's already going to be super awesome. Folks, thank you for tuning in. See you next time.